This is part three of CIS 30A week four lecture, which covers class inheritance or polymorphism. Um, in this particular part of the, the video, we're going to talk about multi-class and the use of multi-class um, in Python. So inheritance <coughs> is a feature in the object-oriented programming that allows class to inherit methods and attributes from a parent class. Um, this allows you to access methods and attributes from one class to another. And for the class, when we start at the class that would have no inheritance feature, um, but we can incorporate inheritance across multiple class for our object oriented programming. So to start, what we have is we have a parent class and this parent class is also known as a base class. And it, this is at top level in which the other class would inherit from the parent class. Under the parent class, we can have a child class, which is known as a derived class that inherits from the parent or another class. So a child class is a subclass of the parent or the base class. That's level one. And you can have additional subclasses under either the child or the parent. So in the parent, the base class, you can have multiple subclasses or you can have multiple level where you have the parent class, the child class, and another sub level would, would be the grand, the grandchild class. So in Python, you would have four types of inheritances. You would have a single where there's only one class. You would have multi-level where you would have parent, child, and possibly grandchild, or you would have multiple inheritances where you would have a parent with two subclasses, two derived classes, or two children, or you would have hierarchical where you would have parent, child, and grandchildren. So here it describes each one and you need to include this as part of your lab. Also, you need to know this for your final exam. So for a single inheritance where you would have a class that inherits and of the methods and attributes from the parent, and we would use the super method to make the child class inherit all the methods property from the parent. So in this one, the example for this is we have a class called student. And the class, this class is inherited from person as the, the, the parent class would be specified in the parameter here. So what we would have is we would have all the attributes, the last name, from the parent class, which is person, that would be carried from the person class down to the student class, which is the child. So from there, what we would then incorporate additional attributes, so that way our program would be able, our object would be able to access all the attributes from the parent within the child class. So to illustrate this example, what we have here is we have a complete program. The first class is the parent class or the base class called person. And we have first name and last name declared here as instance attribute for the person's class. 
then within the person class we also have a method called print name and using this method we would be able to output the first name and the last name next we have an object called x and for x we wanted to be able to access the attribute and be able to display the first name as Marcus and the last name as Brown. And we would be able to call the method there. So here we, we, use, we use the object to access the attribute and we use the object to access the method. Next, we have a second class. And in the second class, we name the second class student. And we know it is a subclass of person as we see person is in the parameter here of our class as it's declared. Since we don't have additional, we don't have any, any additional methods or in, instance attributes for this particular class, we simply put a pass. And then we would use the object to access the attributes to display Mike Olson. And also the methods to be able to print the first and last name. So next is we would know that this is inheriting the first name and last name as it is a subclass of person. So when we run this program, the first name that it's gonna print will be Marcus Brown as it is accessing the attributes and the method for the first part here for the object. Then the second print where it shows Mike Olson, which is when we would access the method and the attributes for the object and we actually append Mike Olson for this for as part of the second the, the second round for that object to access under student. So as you can see you can use a subclass to be able to inherit the attributes and the methods from the first class, which is person in this example. In the next example here, I'm gonna talk about multiple inheritance. And in this inherit in multiple inheritance program, we have class one as the first class. It has a method called M1. It's gonna print in class one. And in the second class, we have a second class called class two. It is a subclass of class one, as we can see that it's specified here. It has a method called M2, and it's gonna print in class two. The third class we have is class three. It is also a subclass of class one, and it has a method called M3. It would print in class three. Lastly, we have a class four, mm -hmm. and this class four is a subclass of class two and class three. It's the child of the second class and the third class. It has the method called M4, and <clears throat> it would print in class four. We have OBJ as the object for class four. And we would use the object to access the method of class one, the method of class two, the method of class three, and the method of class four. So here we go. When we run this, since we started with the class four, it would go from class four 
and then it would then go to move back up class three class two and class one so in this case we have our last class class four it's inheriting from multiple classes which is class two and class three. And you can also find this example on our notes on page nine, after it talks about our multiple inheritance scenario. Um, there is not really a limit on for the number of parents that you can have um, and how it would inherit the methods from those parents. So if you wanted to incorporate as many as you have declared in the program, you can. However, the important notes is that we wanted to reduce the program redundancy and we want to make sure that it's complex or sometimes troubleshooting them, you know, that can cause some issue with troubleshooting if it's not properly incorporated. So some of the things that you need to know for the rules is the method resolution order, the MRO. MRO prevent local presidents ordering by providing monotonicity in that it ensures the class always appear before its parents. So when we're looking at the MRO, the class can be viewed as the attribute or the method and the former returns while the returns the list. So when we're looking at base one and base two, they're both parents of the derived class, then the attribute from, from the multiple parents that will be ordered based on the, the class, how it's structured from the base. So base one and then base two. With the multiple inheritance, the example that we just looked at, you can see that on page 10, where we have class four and class four inherits from class two and class three. Now that would be different from multi-level inheritance, where you would have a parent class or the base class and then you would have the immediate class or the child class and then you would have the derived class as the grandchild class this is known as the multi-level inheritance the example of this is shown on the bottom of page 11 so in this example we have three classes a b and c the first class is the base class, that's the parent class. And in this, we simply just wanted to print A. The second class, we have a B class. It is a subclass of A. And we would print B. And lastly, we have the third class, which is class C. It is the grandchild of class A the child of class B, it inherits from B, then we will print class C. And in this one, different than the prior one that you've seen, in this one we include the super method here. So if you include the super, that allows it to point back to the base class or the prior level class. So since C is inheriting from B, we can use the super method here to say that it is a subclass. And B is a, su a subclass of A, we would use some super method here to say that it is a subclass of A. So lastly, on the last line here, we have the object OB, which we create an object and the object is of class C. So when we run this, what would we would do is we would then act use the object to access to access the each of the class based on the inheritance. So it then would print a 
b and c as we would c is inheriting from b where it would be would it print b and b is inheriting from a where in which it would print a now important to point out going back to the beginning section jumping back up and talking about polymorphism and it is a condition of occurrence in different forms in this example um, it provides you with a method called join and we have ABC we then would print a concatenate would be concatenate with C and then we would update that and we would join 334 and we would also join ABC so it refers to how we would use a single type entity um, to represent different types in different scenario and that's what polymorphism is is to be able to use one, one type that would represent different types in different cases so to show illustrate this this is the program that we just discussed um, here we have the join method we start out with using ABC and so when we print this we a is then 3 is then it's going to be implemented for A another 3 is implemented for B and 4 is implemented for C so when we operate the addition here it's going to print 10 then since this is integer for the first join the second join we're going to use string which is a different type and in the second round what we have is we would join a b c so it simply concatenate a b and c and it prints a b and c together with no space so as you can see this is an example of polymorphism and you can find the example and the definition on page six of your notes Lastly, we're going to talk about local and global and non-local variables. Um, this is an addition portion to CS30A um, as part of this chapter. This reference back to what we previously discussed in the variable section earlier in the semester. Um, so, so far we've been using local variables in our methods. Um, also, we are using our variables in um, the beginning stage of our programming from week one and week two. So variables are local if it's not declared otherwise. Um, so in Python, what you can use is you can use global. However, the way that we see in C++ and Java is a little bit different on how that would be implemented in Python. Um, it's recommended that we would use we we would use the global variable to with parameter for to be able to output some kind of return value from a method and then be able to bring it into the next method instead of using uh, a variable to store updates of the value um, so when you define a variable inside a definition uh, of the, the method it's really local to that particular method and its scope is only going to be for that block now all variables have a scope of the block and whether they're declared or defined so if you don't specify that it, as it is a global variable it's only going to it's only going to be for that particular block now variables don't have to variables don't have to be declared like the way that you have in C with type however as it's not implicit um, but what we can do is we can also explicitly state that is a global variable by using the keyword global so the example that you see on page 13 
Um, here, it's actually using the global keyword to say that it is a global variable. So if you wanted to specify that this is a global variable, you can also incorporate the keyword there. So to illustrate this, I will uh, show that in the program shows a method called display T. Here we're using the global keyword to say that message one is a global variable. And we wanted to print, we wanted to print this, this, the, the string that's stored in message one. And the string is I love Python. We define that string there for message one. So message one then gets updated with programming is fun. Here, then we call the method display t, and lastly, we will print out the message one. So, and then call display t once again. So, when we run this program, what happened is first it's going to display programming is fun as it would as it was updated here on line 10. Now, since it's updated, it would then print message one as programming is fun. And as we called on the method display T twice, what we see is that it's gonna use message one as I love Python and display it twice because it would then only be the scope for this particular this particular variable. So what we can see here is we can use the global message the global to change our variable and make it a global variable so that way when we use it outside of that scope we will be able to, to display that now next what I'm going to show you is that we are going to talk about non-local variable so Python 3 introduced a non-local variable as a new kind of variable it's very similar to global variable the main difference is that it's not possible to change a variable from the module scope um, so in this example instead of using the global keyword we would use the non-local when we uh, declare that particular variable so I have a method A and this method in 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 the method I have declared city as my variable it stores the string corona within that particular method I nest another method called B and inside B I have a non-local variable declared as city and city stores Merino Valley string. Then I print before calling B, it should show the outside. Then next, after call after calling B, it should show what's inside. So when I run this, what happened is it's gonna show like what we expected Corona as the city before it calls the B. As it's nested within this, the scope would only be without the non-local city would only be within here, but since we're using the non-local key, the non-local to, to, to say that it is a non-local variable, it's gonna be able to scope outside of B method. So after we call B, we would be able to show Moreno Valley 
and then on the outermost here when we when we update the city with Paris and then we would print the city in Maine that would be in that that would be Paris and that's outside of the scope for A and B so as you can see very similar to global that you can use non-local however non-local is slightly different so that it would not be able to change from module scope it can also only be used inside a nested function or a nested method so when you nest it inside a method you want to use non-local instead of global lastly um, now if we change that program and we we make it global instead when we run this you would still have you would still have the same output however the main difference is that now what you see is you would see that when we make this a global before calling b it's going to be paris and after calling b it would be merino valley so it would actually bring this and plug it down here and here whereas if we keep it with the non-local the output for this it would only pertain to this scope for the non-local and it won't reach out here compared to when we change it to global for the nested inside it would take this and bring it all the way out to me so that's a true difference that you see when you compare between the local and uh, the, the global and non-local so the example you will find that example on the last part of the notes which is page 14 and 15 please take a look at it to see the difference between the two um, so as you would need to be able to incorporate this uh, possibly for the next part which is tk enter um, and that will be the last part of our lecture which is in week five um, and this concludes my Part 3 of our lecture in CAS 30A, Week 4.